How many of y'all ever been told you were substandard? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How many of y'all just means to rebuff, especially to deny acceptance, care, and love to someone? How many of y'all ever felt like a loved one has withheld love from you, just refused to love you? That hurts. Now, I'm going to be sharing, I'm going to be jumping back into the Old Testament, so I'd like for you to open your Bibles first to Romans 15.4. Romans 15, 4 says, Here Paul is talking, and he says, For whatever things were written before, he's speaking of the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Chapter 10, starting with verse 5, to get the context. Here he's talking about the people of Israel as they have come out through the Red Sea, out of bondage. He says, but with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became my examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Do not become idolaters as some of them were. It is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor tempt Christ as some were tempted and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor complain as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all of these things happened to them as examples and were written down on our, for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages has come. And so the Old Testament was written that you might have hope and also that you might read these, that you might have an admonition to look and see and to learn from other people's mistakes. You know, if you don't read history, history is very important because people tend to make the same mistake over and over again. And if you read from history, then perhaps you can not make, go through the pain of making mistakes, learn from someone else's mistake. And so there are several other scriptures I have here. Second Timothy three fifteen sixteen says that all scriptures God breathed. And Second Peter three sixteen says uh, some of Paul's teachings were hard to understand, and they were twisted by other people as they do the other scriptures. Now, let's go on to uh, rejection. I want you to look first at Ezekiel 16. Now here we're going into the Old Testament and we're looking at Old Testament prophecy. Now Old Testament prophecy was was given frequently it had a immediate interpretation and then it had an interpretation into the future. And I can sit and talk about Old Testament prophecy and things that were prophesied that came to pass 200 years later, 500 years later, 1,000 years later. But this I want to talk about, and it's written to Jerusalem. Now, you realize, of course, that Jerusalem in the Old Testament was a type of the church. In Galatians 4, 24 to 26, Paul speaks of the two Jerusalems. The Jerusalem on Mount Sinai, the Jerusalem uh, in Israel, represents Mount Sinai and the law. But the Jerusalem that is above is the mother of us all. And in Revelation 12, 21, uh, 21, 2, I'm sorry, uh, 
it says that the new Jerusalem, the bride of, the, of Christ, is coming down. And so you are the new Jerusalem. And this prophecy was written to you to show you your heritage and to give you your history. And I want to go through it with you. I will, everybody open the Bible to Ezekiel 16. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, cause the church to know her abominations. Thus says the Lord God to the church, Your birth and your nativity from, were from the land of Cana. Cana means rejection, rejected, or despised. Your mother was an I'm sorry, your father was an Amorite, your mother was a Hittite. The Amorites were, means pride, Hittite means terror or fear. That is your heritage before salvation. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. You were not washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped with swaddling clothes. No, I pitied you to do any of these things to have compassion on you. But you were thrown into an open field where you yourself were loathed or despised on the day you were born. Now that people is a picture of absolute rejection. And then he says, but when I pass by, and remember that the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Christ. Jesus is speaking to you. When I pass by to you again, and let's see, when I, no, I'm going down too far. Verse 6. When I passed by you, and saw you struggling in your blood, I said to you, live. I said, yes, live. That describes being chosen or elected for salvation before the foundation of the world. Jesus looked at you and he said, live. Now, where in the Bible does it say that? Well, let's look at uh, Ephesians 1, 4 to 5. Starting with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. And they said, now wait a minute, Billy, are you preaching predestination? What about the human will? Well, let's look at 1 Peter 1 2 and see what that says. Now, don't get mad with me, people. I'm just reading scripture to you. Okay? And we'll try to. I hope I don't want to step on anybody's doctrinal toes this morning. If I step on your toes, I'm sorry. I don't mean to. Please forgive me. But don't get mad with me. Let's just see what the Bible says. Okay. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispension in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit by obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. God knew beforehand whether or not you were going to accept Him. He elected you on the basis of His foreknowledge. Now you remember God sits in the center of time. He knows everything in the past. He knows the present. 
and he knows what's going to happen in the future. He made you a creature of free will. He wanted you to freely accept him, to freely love him. But he knows who's going to love him and who isn't because he's God. How does he do that? He's God. Who can comprehend the height and depth and width of his love? He is everywhere. He's like the light. He's everywhere. He knows all things. He sees all things. He's all powerful. Where can you go to hide from him? If you go to the depths of the sea, he's there. If you go to the heights of the heaven, he's there. If you go down into the cave and hide, he's there. You can't get away from him. He knows, and he knows the, what you're thinking and the thoughts and the intents of your heart. Praise you, Lord. Okay, so he... Going back to... Let's go back now to... Ezekiel. And he says, I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew and matured and became very beautiful, and your breasts were formed, and your hair grew. But you were naked and bare. Now that word naked there, we will see in a few minutes. I will go back, we'll go back to Genesis. And it first appears in Genesis, and it just appears in Genesis and Ezekiel 16. And it means no covering. No covering, no armor, actually. It means no covering, no armor. Like the physician who doesn't take mal doesn't buy malpractice insurance, he says he's gonna go bare, I'm gonna go naked. He's not going to pay the premium. He's just going to go naked in, and he's going to put everything in his wife's name. And if they sue him, his wife owns everything and they can't even get anything out of him. Therefore, the lawyers won't sue him. That's called going naked. The lawyer says you better be on good relations with you. You better keep, stay on good relations with your wife. <laughs> but that's what it means to go naked, to have no protection. And that's what this word means. Okay. Then when I passed by you again and I looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Now, that word spread, can, spread your wing can also be interpreted. Some of your Bibles will say, I put the corner of my robe over you. Now, you remember when Ruth went to uh, Boaz on the threshing floor, what did she do? She said, cover me with a corner of your garment. Same thing, or spread your wing over me. Well, we won't, that's a... But he... And I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you and you became mine, said the Lord. Now a covenant, a blood covenant is a powerful thing. In the Middle East, and this is a Middle Eastern custom, African and Middle Eastern custom. When a blood covenant was generally entered into by a greater power and a lesser power. And the lesser power entered into the covenant with the greater power for protection. And they had a ceremony. And the lesser power stood on one side, the greater power stood on the other, and they killed a couple of animals and they split them in two. And they put the sides on either side. And this is described in Jeremiah 30, 34, 35. And they walked between them. And they met in the middle. And then there was an exchange of clothes. An exchange of armor. An exchange of a rope and a ring, which is the modern, from where you get the modern wedding ring. In some instances, they would cut a 
a ring around their thumb and rub gunpowder into it so you had a black ring. And the lesser power would take the name of the greater power and say, everything I own is yours. And the greater power said, all the protection and everything I have is yours. You have a right to call upon it should you have a need. That's a blood covenant. And they say, if we do not keep this oath, if I, and he swears, the lesser power swears fidelity, faithful, faithfulness to the greater power. And he says, if I don't keep this oath, may I be like the dead animals on the sides of me. Now, if you want to go back and see this, read this in Jeremiah 34, 35. They were under siege, and they said, we haven't kept the law. We haven't set loose our Hebrew slaves. We are supposed to, they're only supposed to serve us 35 years, six years, and in the seventh year we let them go free, and we've, held, we've killed them in bondage, and so we should need to keep the law, and they all agreed, and they, and they cut a covenant to renew, they renewed the covenant, and they let them all go free, and about a week later they caught, brought them all back into bondage. And God got upset with them. Read it. He said, I'll bless you. I'll bless you with a sword. I'll bless you with pestilence. <laughs> I'll bless you with starvation. <laughs> because you're going to be like the animals you walk between. And read it. It's, it's interesting. God said, if you make a vow, be quick to fulfill it. Well, let's move on. Okay. Now, as I told you once, I think some of you have heard me say this, that my favorite painting of the prodigal son I saw in a Greek Orthodox church. The father was depicted as an oriental potentate flowing beard, big robe, big man, and he was greeting his son, and he wrapped, wrapping his arms and his robe and bringing him in. You see, he went through the village and met him on the other side of the village, so his son wouldn't have to walk through the village in shame. I was that prodigal son. I th Thank you, Lord, for covering me, Lord. I thank you for bringing me back. Bringing me back, Lord God. Letting me... And covering me with your wing, Lord. And making me a member of the household that I became a brother again, Lord. I thank you for it. That I had squandered, but you brought me back, Lord God. Praise God. That's what it means to be covered with the wing. You need to be able to see yourself as the prodigal. That story didn't mean much to me until suddenly God showed me that I was the prodigal, that I had wasted my life in the foreign land, and I had come back to my father's house, and his undying, unconditional love. He was looking for me, waiting for me. He met me and protected me from shame. I'd done so many things that I should be ashamed of, but he erased them. <sighs> Praise you, Lord. Now, when did rejection enter in? When did rejection become our heritage? When did this all happen? It happened in the Garden of Eden. Let's turn back to Genesis to the beginning. In the beginning, God restored the earth in seven 24-hour periods. He restored it in six and he rested on the seventh. It says so in Exodus. It said he created the heavens and the earth. He says, in the beginning God bara, 
created from nothing, the earth. Then the earth came under judgment, and then he restored it in six days. These were six 24-hour periods, people. It says so very plainly in the Bible. And this is truth. He created a man and a woman in their image, or they created the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. It's one of the few places that a, a uh, plural pronoun it says, uh, first pronoun, look at uh, chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so he created man and woman. And then the next chapter he gives you more detail on how he did this. And he created a garden. And he put the man and the woman in the garden to take care or tend the garden. And they had communion with God. And he came and walked with them in the, in the cool of the evening. Now, Scripture says in Psalm 104... Verse 2 that uh, God covers himself with a garment of light. Now, God lives in inapproachable light. Whenever he manifested himself before the incarnation, it was always with clouds around him. He came in a whirlwind, a black cloud, a whirlwind, to conceal the tremendous light which would have, which would, which if you saw it in its intensity would kill you. But he clothed himself in light. And most Bible commentators believe that Adam and Eve in their unfallen state were also clothed in God because likeness means to be like God. We're clothed in light. And Moses, when he went up on the mount and talked to God, and God spoke to him out of the cloud with the, and so forth, when he came down, his skin just glowed. He had to put a veil over his face. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus glowed as did Elijah and Moses. Radiated light. Now, during, I, I had a friend, you know, women are much more spiritually perceptive than men. And it's harder to deceive a woman than it is a man. It's harder. I talked to a friend of mine who was an insurance salesman. And he said before he got saved, he sold insurance plans. And he found that he, the way to sell a woman was to get to know her. To take her out to lunch and talk about her family and talk about what she liked and, and to get to know her and to build a trust with her through just getting to know her. And once a woman got to know him and trusted him, he could sell her anything. Now the devil spoke to Eve. Now the Bible doesn't say how many times he spoke to her. But the devil spoke to her. And I think he spoke to her several times and got to know her. And then he deceived her. Now, Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived. Right? And the deception was the same deception that's in the world today. You know, 1 John 2.16 says, All that is in the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. 
And the devil said, Eve, look at that. said, Eve, can you uh, eat of any tree in the garden? said, oh, no, no, no. The one in the middle we can't eat of or even touch or we'll die. He says, oh, I see. You know, Eve, God's withheld your, his best from you. You know, he doesn't really love you. said, he's withheld. That's the best tree in the garden, and he's held it out for himself. Why, you know, if you eat of that tree, you're going to be like God. You're going to be like God. Now, that's what the devil wanted when he rebelled. Do you remember Isaiah 14? Let's just stop here and look over at Isaiah 14 for a minute. Isaiah 14, starting with verse 12. I have you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the further sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, yet you shall be brought down to seal to the lowest depths of the pit. And that is a, stuck in Isaiah 14, is a description of the rebellion of Satan. He says, I'm going to put my throne up there with God on the, on the north, on the, on, on, and I'm going to be above the clouds, and I'm going to be like God. Well, you know, everybody knows that the devil lost the fight. But, uh, and judgment has been passed on him. And we all know where he's going. Jesus says in Matthew that for the end of the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But uh, the devil was, uh, he didn't want to go alone. And so here was this man that God loved. He fought the God and had gotten whipped. But here was God's image. You know, I remember there was this lady in my hometown who was uh, engaged to a, uh, into a man in the army in World War II. And uh, she had his picture up on the mantle and she wrote him a letter every day. And then about... Uh, He'd been gone about a year. His letters began to get less frequent than he wrote her a letter, a Dear John letter, and told her that... Uh, Y'all know what a Dear John letter is? That's an old expression. But told her he'd found somebody else. And she went home, and man, she took his picture, and she threw it on the floor, and she stomped on it. And then she looked at it, and she took it out, and she put it in the bottom of the, car of the parrot cage. <laughs> now, she couldn't touch him. But she touched his image. And in case you're interested, the word translated image in Hebrew, according to Dr. Derek Prince, comes down into modern Hebrew to mean have your photograph taken. And the devil, that's what he's doing to you. He's so mad because he lost, he can't touch God, but he can touch you. And so he brought Eve, deceived Eve, and Adam rebelled. Eve ate of the fruit. The fruit was pleasant to the eye, good for food, and desirable to make one knowledge. Give one knowledge. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And the devil hasn't changed. You know why he hasn't changed? It still works so well. And uh, they fell. And when they fell, they knew they were naked. Now, the first time the word naked appears in, in the Bible was in uh, chapter 2, verse 25. And it says, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now, that word means to be nude without any clothes on. That's what it means. It means nude, running around without any clothes on. The next time it appears, it says they were naked. 
And that means without armor, without covering, without protection. And so they made aprons out of fig leaves. The, you know, the tunics, some place it says tunics, some place it says loincloths, some place it says aprons. And that's, uh, but in the Bible it doesn't say where they, uh, what they, where they covered. You know, everybody thought they covered their sexual parts, but, and that's what all the Victorian art shows them with the fig leaves covering their sexual parts. But the Bible doesn't say that. The word uh, apron means a belt that girds on, most commonly used in the Old Testament for girding on your sword and girding on your armor. It spoke of Saul girding on his armor. It's used as David girded on his sword, girded on his armor. And then it says God met them called them out and cursed them and then he made coats for them out of skins of animals he started the sacrificial system that was later codified in Leviticus in which an innocent animal paid the price for your sin the price of sin the wages of sin is death Romans says that the wages of sin is death. And he said, I'm going to let an innocent animal die for you. I'm not going to require you to die. I'm going to let you shed this innocent animal, and his blood will cover your sin, will atone for your sin, will cover it. Not forgive it, cover it. And every year, the, the, the sins had to be covered again on the Day of Atonement. Every year they had to be covered again, covered again, never forgiven. But the blood of Jesus Christ atoned for your sin. And the atone in the Greek means to wash away, to cleanse, to wash away. The... Uh, <clears throat> And so here we have Adam and Eve cast out of the garden because they rejected God. Now you've got to see that what did Eve do? Eve rejected God's command. What did Adam do? Adam rejected God's command. He was not deceived. His wife was deceived, it says in 1 Timothy, but Adam was not. So... Adam said no. He loved his wife so much that he rejected God's command and partook of the forbidden fruit. And he rejected God's command and rebelled. And so, here we have Adam and Eve cast out of the garden. And Adam has two sons, Cain and Abel. I don't want to get into that. If I do, I won't get out. But he has two sons, Cain and Abel. Both of those pass out of the picture. Abel is killed by Cain. Cain uh, refused to obey God. He rejected God's command to make a lawful sacrifice. And God said to him, If you do right, as you're told, you'll be okay. But sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you. Let's look at that. I had intended to cover that, but let's look at that. Okay. So Adam, so the Lord, let's look at Genesis 4, 6. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies or crouches at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now that word sin is an interesting word. It's the first time sin appears in the, in the Bible. And it's occasion root is Rasmussus. And I'm sure I've slaughtered that word. 
Okay. But it in the Methamethanian demiology, it means demon. It means demon. And I asked my son, I said, uh, who speaks Hebrew and Greek and has a Ph.D. from Cambridge University and is a Reformation scholar. And I said, oh, is this right? And he said, oh, Dad, you know what? I showed you those. When we went through the Museum of Natural History in London, you remember the Rasmussens? Those were those funny-looking things that had wings. I said, do you mean like those gorgoyles on the, on the Masonic Temple? He said, yeah, that's it. Those are, he said, those are demonic beings, and they're named Rasmussen, and they sit outside the building. They can either be malevolent or malevolent. They can be the good or bad, depending on whether or not you've made an adequate sacrifice to uh, the gods that control to the demon spirits that control them. I said, oh. He said, don't you remember they had a bucket in one hand and a sharp and a pole with a, what looked like a pine cone on the other end? He said, I never figured out what those are. I said, well, I know what they're for. He said, well, you know, if you please the devil, you get to reach into the bucket. And it may be a bucket full of gold or it may have be a bucket full of snakes. You don't know till you stick your hand down in there. You don't know what you're going to get when you deal at the devil's table. But I'll tell you, in the end, you'll get the snake. And the other was a rod that had, I said, Dan, that's a purple shaft with the barbed wire cluster. I said, those people always impaled people. And they just they would just impale you on that stake. The uh, matter of fact, the, uh, the king of Persia, when they, uh, Darius II, when he wrote his letter back to... Uh, the people in Mesopotamia, uh, or the Eura Euphrates, and, and around the Euphrates who were opposing the rebuilding of the temple. He said, uh, I, he said, this is a temple that's being built to the great God. You will not oppose them. Anyone who opposes them will have his house pulled down. A beam will be taken out of it, and they will be impaled upon it. And he went on to say, he said, why should you have them pray for the... He said, you have them rebuild it and pray for the health of the king and his sons. Why should we suffer loss because you are suspicious? Something on that order. But the, the point is that the punishment was to be impaled on a, on a beam. Anyway, that's the meaning of sin. Sin originally was described in Hebrew, and the first one, a sin is a demon. Sin dwells in your mortal body. It says so in Romans. It says don't let it reign in your mortal body. Your old man was crucified that you that the body of sin might be rendered inoperative. It doesn't do away with it. It's just there. You can still yield to it. Sin from within. Let's, I don't want to get into that. I'll be out of that. Okay, let's go on. Okay, how are you covered today? Well, under the Old Testament, you were covered. The wings of the cherubim covered the mercy seat. The one piece of real estate where God dwell in the Old Testament was between the wings of the cherubim over the mercy seat, over the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God dwelled. Now God dwells in a different place. He has a temple not made with hands, a temple. He dwells in your heart, within your spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And how are we covered today? Let's look in Psalm 91. <laughs> it 
Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, shall spend the night. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take your refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Okay. Cover you with His wings. Now Jesus said in Luke and in Matthew, when he looked at Jerusalem, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, old Jerusalem, how often I've wanted to cover you as a mother chick, mother hen covers her chicks under his wings. You know, you got a mother hen with her chicks. And y'all ever seen a mother hen pull her wings out and, and all the little chicks run under them and she holds them close to her body? And if you go over there, she'll peck you good. She will fight you for those chicks. Jesus said he wanted to cover you with his wings. Under his wings you take refuge. It also says that in Psalm 57.1 and Psalm... 17.8 Now this was typified in the, par in the type of shown by Ruth in which Boaz is the kinsman redeemer and she was a kinsman and he redeemed Ruth he covered her with his and married her as he was obligated to under the law. Now, praise you, Lord Jesus, devil. So today, you are covered by the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made a covering to cover you. And you dwell under his wing, under his refuge, as Ruth did. And you've made a covenant. You're a coveted child of God. You've been adopted into the family of God. And you're no longer rejected and unloved. Now you can do, if you read the rest of Ezekiel 16, you will see how the church has gone into, if you can't read the modern church into that, and how the modern church has gone apostate. You know, in the church I was raised in, on the church that in my hometown, in the church that I was attended before I got saved, they hold goddess ceremonies. Yeah. They worship Athena, the goddess of wisdom. They said Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God and the strength of God. And wisdom in Proverbs is, is a type of of, of the creator God and it's in the feminine and they say Jesus it was actually a feminine God not a male God and they worship Athena and they have goddess ceremonies lots of other heretical things they've done they have moved away from the plain teaching of scripture and if you can't see that in the in in the rest of Ezekiel 16, I, it's there. And so, how will you be? So, and we're going to be clothed again. So you know, he, Paul said that he's in this tent, this body, but he's going to be clothed again. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, we have a, we can see what's going to happen when we are clothed. We look at our, our Elijah and Moses, and we'll see we will again be reclothed in light. But until then, 
what do we do? We walk under God's covering. Now, Jesus Christ, He said, everything I say, He says in John, everything I say, God has told me how to say it and what to say, or what to say and how to say it. He was always led completely by the Holy Spirit. I would like to say that I'm led by the Holy Spirit, but I'm afraid there's some times that I don't hear Him real well, you know. My pride or my f comes up and this looks like a good thing to me. You know, Paul uh, said, uh, there are unsaved people down in Ephesus. I need to go down there and save them. And the Holy Spirit of Jesus said, no, you can't go there. So he went up to Bithynia and said, we want to go here. He said, no, you can't go there. So he went down to Troas, and then God gave him a vision, and he went over to Philippi. Now, who would say that it wouldn't be God's will for people to get saved? God told Paul, he had another place for him. He wasn't ready yet. If Paul had gone down there, I can assure you he'd been in what we call today a difficult mission field. <laughs> there wouldn't have been much fruit. And so what happens to us when we rebel? rebel? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, who devise a covering. Now the old King James says covering. Some modern translations say plans. Uh, it literally, it, in Hebrew, means devise a spider's web. Okay? Who do take counsel, but not of me. Who devise plans or covering, but not of my spirit. That they may add sin to sin. Who walk down to Egypt and have not asked my advice. To strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, that's the devil. And to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore... The strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame, and trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. So what happens when you move out from under the wing of God? You know, you're up under the wing here. This is a vision God gave me of it. You're up under the wing here, and the wing's got no holes in it. Those feathers fit together perfectly. It's a perfect covering. There are no holes. But if you move out over here, and you're out from it, and you're spinning your spider web up there, the spider web's real strong. You know, black widow spider's thread is, as str is stronger than steel of equivalent weight. I could always tell when I was a plumber and under somebody's house, and when I hit a spider's web, I could tell a black wood a spider's web. Stronger. That's when I pull my hood up over my head and tied it real tight and begin looking around because I didn't want it to fall down my fall down my neck. That was the thing. I always had fear of the spider was going to get out my fall down my neck. Well, anyway, uh, you walk out and. And up above that spider web is this demon, and he's got this long pole with that cuckaburr on the end, you know. And he sees you, and he pokes you. Oh, God! And you get wounded. And you stagger back up under the web, you know. And you say, oh, God, heal me, Lord. Heal me. You see what he did? Heal me, Lord. And you know, God is gracious. And merciful? You know what the words gracious and merciful mean? 
The word merciful means to be full of compassion. It comes from a, from a Hebrew word that means to pick up and fondle in love. Now the word gracious means to, for a superior person to bend down to another level and to pick up an inferior, to grant favor. And God showed me, the character he showed me was when I used to punish my son. I said, don't touch that television knob. And that little three-year-old, he'd look up at me, and he'd look back at that knob, he'd look at me, and he'd what you going to do about it? What you going to do about it? And so I'd go over and spank his hand, and he'd cry, and then he'd come back over and hold on to me. And I would pick him up and love him, you know. And say, son, I love you. I love you with an unconditional love. You're mine. I love you. But you're going to mind. <laughs> Rebellion has painful consequences, son. God will heal you. He'll let you go out there and you get the pain. Because the demon is there. You're out from under them and he's going to stab you. Now, it's, it, it's, it's wonderful that God heals you, but it's a lot better if you got that you don't need to get healed, that you stay under the wing and stay well. And that is the price of rejecting God's guidance. When you move out from under the wing and you're standing out here naked and bare, you got a covering that's got holes in it, and that covering will allow you to get wounded. Now, God is our Father. Unfortunately, most people's revelation of, of God the Father is based on their human Father. How many of y'all have never heard your father say to you, I love you? Hmm? Be honest now. Look around you and see that, that you, you're not by yourself, you know. My father was a wonderful man. He was a good German, good, strong German. He had some problems, but he was a good man. And he said, of course you know I love you. Don't I feed you? Don't I clothe you? Don't I take care of you? Do I give you money to spend? Don't I send you to school? Yeah, I love you. But he never, ever said, I love you. People need, fathers, I say to you, your children need to hear you say, I love you. I accept you just like you are. I am proud of you. Every day they need to hear you say that to them. Because if you don't, rejection comes in and their vision of God becomes a hard tyrant who never, never expresses love, someone they've got to work for. And they're told that if they just work real hard, God will love them. Or if they keep all the rules just right, God will love them. And they grow up with rejection, with fear as their mother and pride as their father. Now, I'm going to stop here because... The, uh, if I get into the next the next portion of it, well, I think I will look at one or two more things. In uh, Deuteronomy 11, 10 to 12, God said, "I'm taking you into a wonderful land. You've come out of Egypt." where you watered your crop with your feet, which meant they had to get on the irrigation treadmill and walk on that treadmill and bring water up out of the river to irrigate their crops. Because it didn't rain in Egypt. They just had the river. 
So I'm taking you into a land, a beautiful land full of hills and valleys, not flat like the Delta, like the Nile Delta. And I water it with, with rain in the spring and the fall. And as you follow me and you stay on and you stay under my spirit and you follow me, I'll send the rains. But you've got to depend on me entirely to water your crop. You won't be able to do it by your own efforts. And he's talking of there. He's taking you into a land of promises. He's taking you to the promised land, a land of promises. And he says, if you lean on me and stay under my spirit, I'll care for you. But you get away from me into rebellion, the enemy has got rights to you. Now today we go, I'm going to pray for you. See, I've been talking about an hour and a half. It's 11.30. I'm, 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 let's all stand up and praise God. You know, it's said that the brain can absorb what the fanny can endure. <laughs> and you all need to uh, get the blood circulating out of your feet. And we're going to come against the Amorites and the Hittites against fear and pride. And we're going to chip away a little bit at the basis of your Adamic heritage. Say, so, dear Lord, I love you. Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was manifested in the flesh. He died on the cross for my sin, was raised from the dead for my justification, ascended into heaven, sits on the right hand of the Father, ever to make intercession for me. I am a child of God. I have been adopted by Him. I am accepted in the Beloved. In him, I have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, whereby I have been made accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1 7 and 6. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I confess the sins of my ancestors. I confess my sin. Lord, if I have anything against anyone, if I have any anger in my heart against anyone, Lord, Lord, I forgive them. I ask you to bless them, Lord. Oh, Lord, give me the gift of forgiveness that I might repent and turn from it in the name of Jesus. I break all the curses on me and my children forever that have come down through the line and the sins of my ancestors all the way back to Adam. I confess the rejection of God's law and the rejection that came into Adam and was passed on to Seth and, and by Seth, through Seth to me. I reject the rejection in the name of Jesus. I bind it and I command it to leave me. I bind all the Amorite spirits and all the Hittite spirits and I say today that I am an adopted son, that God is my Father. The Jerusalem above is my mother. I am a child of the living God, born by a miracle. I thank you, Lord, 
that I am not rejected. And these rejection spirits have no right to me. I command them to leave me now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You can all sit down now. I want you to keep both feet on the floor and concentrate on what I'm saying now. I'm going to command spirits out of you. I want you to set your mind. I don't want you to pray in tongues. I just want you to set your will against them and force them out as an act of your will. Set your mind against them and push them out. Now, spirits come out through your mouth, through your nose, through your ears. Generally, they'll come out as a cough or a yarn. Sometimes you might throw up. That's fine. If you throw up, we'll clean it up. Don't worry about your dignity. You can get your dignity back. If you got to choose between your dignity and your demons, let your demons go. You can get your dignity back. In the name of Jesus now, Lord, I thank you and I bind the spirits of rejection in Jesus' name. I bind the Canaanite spirits of rejection in the name of Jesus. I just bind them and command them to leave God's people in Jesus' name. Turn them loose. Turn them loose. All the rejection. Come out now. Come out in the name of Jesus. All you Amorite spirits of rejection now, of pride, in the name of Jesus. All you legalistic spirits. All you spirits of religious legalism. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. All you Amorites of pride. Pride will keep the law. I'm proud. I can keep the law in the name of Jesus. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. I can keep the rules. Everybody can see I'm holy. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. All you legalism, come out. All you Amorites of legalism, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. All you religious Pharisee spirits, I bind you in Jesus' name. Come out in the name of Jesus. All spirits of fear, fear of not being good enough, fear of not being loved, fear of not being accepted, I bind you in Jesus' name. Come out of God's people. I bind you and I break your power. You will leave God's people now in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on out. Come on out. 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 You can't stay. I send the hornets from heaven after you in the name of Jesus. Come out. I send the hornets. The singing scourge will come and drive you out in the name of Jesus. And I bind you and I break your power. Every one of you. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. All you spirits of self-hatred, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. Out. Out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on out in the name of Jesus I say to the people on the prayer team, now you see somebody that's having trouble, that's manifesting, come pray for him. Come stand beside him and pray for him. In the name of Jesus, I bind you and I break your power in Jesus' name. Come on out of there. Out in the name of Jesus. Leave them. Come out. You can't stay. You can't stay. All of you. I break your power and I bind you and I break your power. You will leave God's people in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on out of there in Jesus' name. Every one of you. We break your power in the name of Jesus. Lord, send your hornets now, Lord God. I break all the power of fear now. Fear of not being good enough in the name of Jesus. I break the power of denial of love in the name of Jesus. Fear that you're not going to be loved. Turning to the world for love. I break the power of lust and perverseness in the name of Jesus. Seeking after power and in the name of Jesus and prestige, I bind the spirits of witchcraft in Jesus' name from rebellion. All the spirits of divination, I command you to go in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, touch your people now, Lord God. Lord, just bring down your people, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise you and we bless you and we glorify you, Lord God. Pour your spirit out, Lord God. Pour out your spirit now, Lord. In the name of Jesus, thank you and praise you and bless you, Lord. Touch your people now in the name of Jesus. Thank you and we praise you, Lord. And all God's folks said,